Thanks for tuning in to the Women's Vibrancy Code, a podcast dedicated to helping women move from exhausted to energized, balance their hormones, and feeling turned on by their life, their lover, and themselves. I'm your host, Mariah Brown. I'm a Yale and functional medicine trained women's health expert, midwife, mom, keynote speaker, and self-made entrepreneur. I'm the founder of my signature program, the Women's Vibrancy Code. So sit back, relax, and let's chat about your energy, hormones, libido, and embracing your feminine power. Oh, and you might want to have pen and paper to take some notes on some of these episodes. Welcome back to the Women's Vibrancy Code podcast. Mariah Brown here, and I'm excited to speak with all of you. For the women out there that have painful periods, heavy periods, irregular periods, that bleeding time, let's talk about some causes and some cures. And so here are the things that I've heard. So for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm a women's health expert. I've been attending birth since 2000, but I finished up my master's in nursing at Yale in 2007, and I've been running the women's health in lots of different places since 2007. So yes, this is something that I've dealt with and managed and support women in all chapters of life, whether it was when I ran the teen clinic or I was doing obstetric care and supporting women postpartum or helping them try to get pregnant Um, helping them navigate contraceptive choices, as well as the journey through perimenopause and menopause, and particularly for women in that 35 to 55 age range, this often really becomes a real thing, uh, partially because of what's happening hormonally in the body. And so the things that I hear is women will say, you know, I bleed so heavy, I'm taken down, I'm taken out of work. I have to worry about overflow and it getting on my clothing. I've now been diagnosed with anemia because I'm bleeding so heavy. So I'm talking, let's, let's like really get into this and help you come up with some solutions. And what I want to say out loud is these are solutions other than the pill an ablation or a hysterectomy. Okay. So for the most part at Yale, I was taught you put them on the pill. <laughs> You give them a contraception, you give them a progesterone um, IUD, right? And then it takes away this heavy bleeding. But I go, okay, yes, maybe the heavy bleeding bleeding goes away. And is that just simply Band-Aid care? Are we actually getting to, well, why is the heavy bleeding happening in the first place? What if we go to cause rather than take away the symptom? Same with painful periods. You know, some women, they're in so much pain, they'll double it over. They can't function. They can't take care of their children. Some will have nausea, vomiting, migraines. They're taking pain meds during their bleeding time, ibuprofen, right? And we know that ibuprofen is then causing leaky gut and and tearing up the, the gut lining. Like there's definitely, um, I just want to say out loud, I hear you and I hear these stories and it's very real. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we just go to another med or, you know, some you go to your OBGYN and they do an ablation. Okay, I've assisted in ablations. You, it's in the OR. And it's literally like cauterizing or um, like burning the inside of your uterine lining. So that way it's all kind of, gosh, it sounds crazy, but kind of scarred. So that way that endometrial lining doesn't build up anymore and there's kind of nothing to bleed out. But once again, okay, an ablation might stop the bleeding, but it's not really getting to why is the bleeding happening. So I want to use this time to help you understand why is the bleeding happening? Why is it so painful? And what else can we do? Or like, let's just cut it out. <laughs> like how often, how many people do you know, your mothers, your grandmothers, your aunties, your friends, where they say, well, I just, they, they gave me hysterectomy. They just cut it out because they couldn't figure out how to make it stop bleeding. And then, oh, they took my ovaries too. Well, why did they take your ovaries? I don't know. Okay, so now they've thrown you into menopause, <laughs> running full steam into a br- brick wall. 
for no real apparent reason, in my opinion, okay? If that is something that you've chosen, by no means do I want you to feel guilt or shame about it. We get to move forward knowing that the choices we've made and the life that we've lived are exactly what needed to happen. I really truly believe life is not happening to us. It's happening for us and by us. And if you've made those choices in the past of going on the pill or getting an ablation or having the total hysterectomy, there's still lots that we can do to still look under the hood and go, okay, wait a minute. Why was this bleeding so heavy in the first place? Why was it so painful in the first place? Okay. And then the irregular bleeding, the unknown, and you know, a woman's traveling and then she randomly bleeds, you're on vacation and you're in the ocean with shark and oh no, right? The impact on our sex life or the women that are wanting to do fertility awareness method or try to get pregnant and their bleeding's all over the place. Or f- for the woman in her 40s where, you know, what's going on? Am I ovulating? Am I not? I just bled. I didn't. Then I go three months and I don't bleed and then it's super heavy, right? That haphazard thing, let's talk through this and I'm going to hopefully help you understand what's going on underneath the hood and also what you can do about it. Okay. So um, why not go on contraception such as the pill, the patch, the ring, an IUD? I'm not here to dissuade you or make your decision for you. I think that if if you are sexually active and you know that you don't want to get pregnant, having access to contraception is a really important decision for you to have. And so if that's a decision you're making, then awesome, especially if your bleeding is irregular and you can't use fertility awareness method. To go on exogenous outside of the body, estrogen and progestin, which those are the hormones that are in contraception, there are some things that you need to know. You can go back to one of the very first episodes where I interviewed Dr. Sarah Hill. She wrote the book, Your Brain on the Pill. And we're definitely learning that there are some not so great side effects, particularly to the progestin, which is the form of progesterone in contraception. It sends the adrenals in hyperdrive. There's a lot there that isn't ideal. And post birth control syndrome is a real thing. Okay. So now if you need contraception and that's what works for you, cheers to you. And we just know that when you're done, we're going to give your liver some extra support to help detoxify and that you go into it with eyes wide open, knowing um, the risks and the benefits and all the various options of contraception. And so that's not for this episode, but I could do another episode really getting into, well, how do I decide if I want to do the Mirena or a copper-based IUD or having my tubes tied or going on the pill, the patch, you know, there's a lot of different options out there. Um, so let's talk about cause. First, I want to talk about estrogen and progesterone because those are really the two main hormones at play that are influencing our menstrual cycle. Okay. So the first half of the cycle is what's called the follicular phase. During that phase, our estrogen naturally builds. It mainly comes from our ovaries. Although as we start progressing through perimenopause, you know, beyond age 35, Sometimes the ovaries start slowing down or becoming a little bit more irregular. And so that estrogen is also more irregular. And then as we get closer to menopause and beyond menopause, the ovaries go to sleep, so to speak, and stop being the source of hormone production. And instead, it comes from other places. It comes a lot from the adrenals. It also um, is produced in the brain and the skin and, and adipose tissue, fat tissue, And that also that fat tissue also stores estrogen. So often women, particularly like 30 or 45 to 55, will notice some changes in body composition and putting on some extra weight. Part of that is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a compensatory um, action that your body's taking because it's finding new ways to make sure that you still have estrogen. So anyway, first half of the cycle, we've got estrogen building. Once it crosses over a certain threshold, it then sends the memo to the pituitary and the, the ovaries, and then what's called LH and FSH start being produ- produced, which kind of finish up and mature the egg and then tell the egg, go ahead and ovulate. Okay. So then we have ovulation. And ovulation is what's considered the main event. So we have ovulation as the main event, and ovulation is what stimulates progesterone production. 
Progesterone is the hormone of the second half of our menstrual cycle for the women that are actively ovulating and in your fertility years. Okay. So the challenge is as a woman starts ovulating less often, then she starts bleeding less often. The reason that you have a menstrual bleed is because you ovulated. Okay. So if a woman is having irregular bleeding, it can use, you mean a few things. It means you're ovulating irregularly most of the time. And there are some other random things like PCOS or maybe a cervical polyp or, you know, something going on in your uterine lining. But the thing to keep in mind is if you don't ovulate, then it doesn't stimulate progesterone production. And if you don't ovulate, then you don't bleed. So what happens with heavy bleeding in particular, is it in, for, in my mind, I go, okay, we likely have some estrogen dominance. Either the estrogen is too high or the progesterone is too low in relationship to the estrogen. So it's not, let me go get a blood test and look at my estrogen and progesterone levels. In my opinion, right now, the serum tests that are available, the blood tests that are available really don't give us enough quality information. The ranges are really broad. It, they're changing all the time. So it really needs to be in a, just done in a certain day in your menstrual cycle. So that's one of the reasons why I prefer looking at the Dutch test. So dried urine, total comprehensive hormones. It's I like to order the Dutch plus for my clients. So now we're looking at your hormones through urine and your um, adrenals through saliva. And I, cannot, and I can know, okay, this was drawn between day 18 and 22. Okay. So now this is beyond after ovulating. So I should see a spike in your progesterone. And then I look at the relationship between that estrogen and progesterone. And if there's a wide gap, that often is like, aha, here's what could be going on that's causing the heavy bleeding, causing the painful bleeding. Okay. Because what that's telling me is as estrogen is building in that first half of the cycle, what it's doing is it's building up the bed inside your uterus. It's building up your endometrial lining. And it does that for a good reason, right? We want a, spa- a place for implantation to take place because we want to procreate and survive as a species, right? Whether or not you want to actually um, get pregnant. And so um, if estrogen is high and progesterone is low, now we have extra buildup, extra buildup, extra buildup, extra buildup. And so then when it's time, when you do finally ovulate, and then you have a menstrual bleed, there is more to bleed out, okay? So if you cut your finger and then you put pressure on it, right? The, you put pressure on it to stop it from bleeding, right? So inside our endometrial lining, our uterus is kind of trying to do the same thing. It's bleeding out that endometrial bed that was built up in the first half of the cycle, but it also wants to slough it off and then stop the bleeding. And so within that uterine wall, it's creating its own kind of like constrictions, okay? But when there's more bed that's been built up, it has a little bit of a harder time and it tends to be more painful. And sometimes you bleed and you bleed and you bleed and the uterus is having a hard time kind of clamping down. And so then women end up being diagnosed with anemia because they're losing so much blood during their menstrual time or they're bleeding for so long. Okay. You add in a fibroid, which is a benign tumor that's there in the endometrial lining. Go back to this example of, I'm going to put pressure on it when it's bleeding Okay, if the the inside of the uterus is trying to kind of clamp down to stop the bleeding, but there's this, um, imagine like a, a, it makes me think of a matzo ball. (laughs) But for those of you that don't um, have matzo ball, think of just like a, 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 a raspberry, but it's a harder raspberry. If it's right there sitting in your uterine lining and the uterus is trying to clamp down to stop the bleeding, it anatomically kind of gets in the way. So how ironic that for a woman who's been diagnosed with fibroids, it's generally the excess estrogen that's behind the culprit of the fibroid. And the fibroid is exacerbating the excess bleeding and the painful bleeding. How fascinating, right? 
So what we want to do is we want to check that estrogen and make sure that it's there in healthy levels because estrogen is good. We want estrogen to maintain our bones and, and our brain clarity and our oh, so much um, our mood and our, our vaginal health, all of that. But we don't want it so high because when it's too high, now we have risk of estrogen-dependent cancers like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, right? The not so great stuff, plus fibroids. And then the women come in with a really heavy pleading. So how ironic that generally when a woman has really painful, heavy bleeding, often the culprit is excess estrogen and not enough progesterone. And so then they're put on the pill, giving them more estrogen and giving them synthetic progesterone that generally comes from horse urine. And the body actually doesn't know how to truly metabolize. So now we might be changing the symptom of the bleeding, but we're not necessarily getting to the cause. Okay. So what can be one of the causes of excess estrogen? One is just, are we being exposed to endocrine disruptors? Okay. So for many women, we need to really be honest with ourselves. Look at our shampoos, our conditioners, our face lotions, our lotions, our makeup, our laundry detergents, our cleaning products, the fragrancy, um, air fresheners and candles. I mean, it, the plastic water bottles, there's so many places where endocrine disruptors are, are in our environment that we're being exposed to. And ironically, the body takes it in and it actually mimics hormones, specifically estrogen. So for some women, that's part of the cause of the excess estrogen. For other women, they're not ovulating. So are they not ovulating because the pituitary isn't quite communicating correctly? Their thyroid isn't doing well. We need to go in and give some thyroid support. Um, who knows? I mean, there's lots of different causes. But if you're not ovulating, it's not stimulating the production of progesterone. And so now we don't have the progesterone to um, balance out that estrogen. Okay. Can, can you see what I'm, what I'm saying here? For a woman who's not sleeping well, okay, sleep has a big impact on our hormone production, specifically progesterone and testosterone. If a woman has high inflammation, maybe she's had high stress, maybe she's been eating a diet that really is not super rich in fruits, vegetables, and berries, a little bit too much fast food, a little bit too much gluten, a little bit too much alcohol, too much caffeine, whatever it may be that's causing inflammation in the body. Well, inflammation then impacts everything. It impacts everything and can often be the cause of this imbalance in estrogen and progesterone and then cause the heavy bleeding, the painful bleeding, specifically more pain. And then we go, okay, well, what about blood sugar management? If your blood sugar is out, out of whack, that can be the cause of the inflammation the inflammation can be the cause of blood sugar mismanagement and being irregular. Okay. And then if your blood sugars are out of whack, now we're looking at PCOS and PCOS, you have irregular bleeding. If your blood sugars are out of whack, often the, the body's under a lot of stress. And I, for those of you that maybe you've heard in one of my podcast episodes, when you're under high stress, the body doesn't know the difference between real or imagined, okay, which is why you can watch a scary movie and your palms are sweating and your heart is racing. It's as though it's happening, okay? We can be dealing with stress at the cellular level and it's very subconscious. We don't necessarily feel it or know it's happening. We, I don't sit here and go, oh my gosh, it feels so good that I'm not getting a cavity right now. We don't necessarily feel it happening, but stress is stress. So if I'm being chased by a lion the body goes into self-preservation. So it will always choose stress over bless. Bless being those yummy hormones, plus our oxytocin and feeling good. Choosing stress over bless means I have to survive. I'm going to run fast, fight hard, freeze well, okay? So in a stressful time, the body turns off digestion, turns off the immune system, turns off clarity of thought and turns off hormone production. Okay. So can you see how when we're looking underneath the hood, where's the stress coming from? Is it coming from how we're thinking? Is it coming from lack of sleep? Is it coming from our diet? 
Is it coming from our finances? Is it coming from a caustic relationship that's not really serving us? Is it coming from women not setting boundaries and saying no to the things that they want to say no to, not speaking our truth, not doing what's really in our heart and our passion? So we're living kind of like inauthentic to ourselves. I call that stress. And that's going to then cause inflammation and it's going to be the culprit behind our insulin or a blood sugar dysregulation, which is then going to impact our hormones. And then women come to me and they have heavy bleeding, painful bleeding, irregular bleeding, and they go, can we fix this? Yes. But if you're looking for just a quick fix, you know, cut it out, give me a pill. I'm not the place to come to. That's not necessarily my go-to. I don't judge you for it as long as you're making an educated decision. And you're saying this is what works for me, right? The other piece, just to, to make sure I say out loud, is it can also be an issue of not detoxing well. Okay, so maybe a woman comes in and she has the most impeccable diet. She has low stress. She's ovulating every month, but her body's not detoxing. She's constipated. Her thyroid is off. Or when you, I look at her Dutch test, the way that she methylates, the way that she metabolizes, the way that her body kind of like from a genetic code takes the estrogen and gets it out of the body, it's going down a pathway that's not so great. So we're producing estrogen, we're being exposed to estrogen, we're producing hormones, then our body is getting rid of them through the liver, through the detoxification pathways, through pooping, sweating, and peeing them out. So sometimes what's happening is a woman simply isn't getting it out. So now it's being recirculated through the body, and now we have excess estrogen and not enough progesterone. And so now a woman comes in with heavy bleeding, painful bleeding, or irregular bleeding. Um, And just to speak to thyroid, even if you have gone to your provider And maybe you have heavy bleeding, painful bleeding, irregular bleeding. Maybe you can't lose some weight. Maybe you're constipated. Maybe you're sad. Maybe you're tired. Maybe you're not sleeping well. Maybe you have um, cold or hot intolerance. Um, Your hands and feet can never quite get get warm. Uh, Maybe there's some dry patches, some strange rashes, brittle hair, uh, brittle hair, thinning hair. All of those in my mind, I'm thinking thyroid. So maybe you have some of those symptoms. You've gone into your provider and they said, oh, I ordered your thyroid labs and everything is normal. Dun, 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 dun. Well, I go, okay, did they order a TSH and a free T4 and a free T3? Go back. Look at the lab work that's been ordered. Look at your blood tests. Okay, I want to see your TSH between one and two. I want to see your free T4 in a, in like the mid range of that normal range, not right on the brink of normal. Same with your T3, okay? And so sometimes you do have a subclinical hypothyroidism or maybe even your immune system has been so off from all the stress. Now it's to the point where it's almost like an autoimmune thing where your thyroid is fighting it against itself and your thyroid antibodies are out of whack, and that was missed. So depending on what type of provider you're seeing, I go, hmm, have we really ruled out that it could be your thyroid? Um, okay. To speak to anemia briefly, uh, you know, I, I hear women, they go, oh, yeah, I was put on the pill. I was put on an iron pill. I'm going to go in for an ablation. Hmm. All right. So iron pills. I'm sorry, not a big fan. Okay. Can we, can we address why the bleeding is happening? Can we increase iron rich foods and then come up with with a better, if you're going to do a supplemental iron source, there are many that are much better. I'm not going to get into it, but I just want to say out loud If that has been the go-to, most of the ferrous sulfate, most of the iron supplements that women are put on, it's not well absorbed, okay? It's putting extra work on the liver, tends to cause constipation, and once again, it's not really getting to, well, why am I anemic in the first place? Why is the bleeding so heavy? Um, From a gut perspective, that's where we start. So from a functional medicine lens, that we start with the gut. Could there be malabsorption? 
Okay. Could there be a gut dysbiosis where there's something out of whack with the bacteria that are there and the bacteria that aren't there, or the one is high and one is low. Maybe there's an issue with leaky gut and I'm eating all this amazing food, but my body simply isn't absorbing the nutrients from that food. And so now it's not getting the nourishing it needs. So now it feels stressed out and that's part of the cause of now it's not producing the hormones that it needs to and it's Im- impacting the estrogen and progesterone. The other thing with really going to the gut is there are some specific markers that we can look at in something like a GI map test that show a predisposition towards um, specifically impacting your estrogen level. And the other thing is low DHEA. So as a reminder, DHEA is an adrenal hormone. It's an adrenal androgen. And it's, but it's not really a hormone. It's a precursor to estrogen, testosterone, and even converts a little bit into progesterone. And generally, once we cross over 30 to 35, our DHEA naturally goes down. And so that could be another thing just to consider and look at from an adrenal perspective. Okay, so let's go into some solutions and hopefully this is helpful for you. So generally from a functional medicine lens, like I said, we're going to go to look at gut health. We look at adrenal health. We look at your liver and how your body's detoxing. We look at your thyroid, your stress level, and then looking specifically at hormones. So gut health, um, best test on the marketplace if you want to really look quantifiably, I think, is the GI map test. It's actually a stool collection. And you've got to have someone that is really good at reading that test. For the women that come into my space, I'm getting better at reading the test. But even still, I actually have my team dietitian still be the one to read that test just because there are so many nuances. There are so many little hidden cues. We just did a consult with a client of ours. And, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking we're going to address the estrogen dominance. And she was, we're going over it together with the dietitian. And she's like, you know, I see signs that um, your digestion from your swallowing to the upper part of your stomach is likely slow and likely increasing acid and extra mucus production. And she's like, how did you know that? I'm constantly clearing my throat. She's seen a speech um, specialist because she's always losing her voice and she has so much acid reflux. And so she'd been put on meds and seen speech therapy. And now we get to go, huh, isn't this fascinating? We get to look through the GI map lens of those nuances. Okay. So from a gut health perspective, that's kind of a side comment, but I just thought it was so interesting. We want to increase probiotic rich foods. So your sauerkrauts, your pickled things, your kombucha, your um, kimchi, uh, your uh, kefir, yogurt, ideally dairy-free, right? And increase your prebiotic rich foods. So prebiotics go in and help the body, help the good bacteria do a better job at once what it wants to do. Okay. I just want to say out loud, I don't want you to get overwhelmed. So I'm going to go over kind of systematically how I think about this and address it. This does not mean you do it all at once. Okay. This does not mean that you're going to be feeling better in one month's time. I want to remind you that what you're ovulating now and this month's menstrual bleed is based on the last three months of your lifestyle and nutrition and thinking. Okay. So this is, I'm looking through the lens of slow and steady wins the race here. So we want to address the gut. We want to bring in the prebiotic rich food. So those are like your artichokes, um, your asparagus, your Jerusalem artichoke, onion, garlic, leeks, legumes, that kind of thing, okay? And take out those pro-inflammatory foods that really aren't serving your gut. For some people, that's taking gluten out. For some people, that's taking caffeine and alcohol out. For some people, that's taking out your processed foods, your fast foods, okay? Making sure that you're eating produce that's organic and that gets to be layered one step at a time. But I want you to know that it is significant in the context of this conversation if you want to actually feel better and get to cause, not just burn the inside of your uterine lining or have a total hysterectomy. And often I hear from women that that's kind of the only option that's given to them. Pill, ablation, total hysterectomy. And if you are going to do the hysterectomy, 
ask for them to keep your ovaries in there. Don't let them scare you. Like there's, there's reasons why we want the hormones that come from our ovaries. Okay, so then we go to our adrenals. Adrenals are the place of fight, flight, or freeze. They're the place of handling stress. That's where our cortisol comes from. But it's also part of supporting our hormonal well-being, okay? So you hear me talking about adaptogen elixirs a lot. We definitely want to bring in those adaptogen elixirs. We want to practice stress reduction and breathing and yoga and and shinrin yoku, which is forest bathing, get into the forest as much as possible. You know, there's lots of different things that we can do there, but just know that it's it's relevant and it's important, okay? Um, if you're going to do intermittent fasting, in my, it's still, I mean, lots of people are big fans of intermittent fasting through the morning and having a really shortened time span of eating. I'm still not a fan. Yes, to stopping caloric intake within four hours of going to bed. Yes, sleeping through the night, sleeping eight hours, and there's your 12 hours, Okay. But I actually think that when we wake up, we need quality protein, we need quality fat, we need quality fiber to get started, particularly for our adrenal well-being, okay? So I know that that's controversial and, you know, there's a lot of experts that I really know, love, and trust. And, um, you know, they're advocating that women wait until, you know, noon and only eat from like noon to four or noon to five. And I just... I'm, I'm not there. I'm not on the same page from a blood sugar management perspective, from an adrenal well-being perspective. And also just, I don't want you to live a life where you feel like the walls are caving in and it's all about restriction. Okay. We need to feel like our wings can fly and we feel free. And so no, you're never going to hear me suggesting that you weigh your food or count your calories or, you know, for me, it serves me. I haven't had dairy since 98. I haven't had gluten since, oh God, I don't even remember, maybe 2017. But that serves me because I know I feel better when I do that. And so it's not coming from a victim space or I can't. It's I choose that because I choose to feel good and I like feeling good and I found that way that works for me. So for those of you listening you know, I, I, I'm not a big fan of these really extreme diets, especially if you're someone with a history of eating disorders or body dysmorphia. Like we want it, we want you to feel free. We want you to feel like you're setting the boundaries that serve you and you're making decisions from a really empowered place. And then that's going to help your adrenals because it's reducing stress and it's allowing you to feel fully expressed. It's also supporting your thyroid. The thyroid exists in the throat. That's the place where we speak our truth. And when the thyroid is off, it's communicating directly with what's called the HPA axis, which is impacting our adrenals. It's also impacting our ovulation. It's also impacting our hypothalamus, which is that old place of stored trauma. Can you see how it's all connected? This is not a linear thing. It's not a direct cause and effect. Like I have the visual of all these random words on a page and you can see how all the lines connect and everything connects to everything. So then it ends up, ends up looking like a big web, right? Your gut, your inflammation, your adrenals, your liver, your, um, your memory, your brain, your inflammation. I don't know. All of them. They're all interconnected. Okay. So your liver, obviously keeping alcohol intake to um, a minimum. But the other things that we can do to support our liver would be hydrating well. Um, eating lots of bitters, so your bitter greens, adding in dandelion root. I love dandy blend. I, I add it into all of my adaptogen elixirs. You know, anything that you can get that's that's bitter. And keep in mind that your liver already has hundreds of jobs every day just to keep your heart beating, your lungs breathing. It processes everything that you're exposed to through your nose, through your skin, through your mouth, all the supplements you're taking. And so keep that in mind. I'm not a fan of you just having the shelf of supplements. Let me just randomly add these things in a multivitamin to see like throw spaghetti on the wall because know that each of those things is adding a job to the liver. So my preference is that it's a very deliberate, very personalized approach and we have to use discernment. Okay, if we're going to add this supplement, is there a supplement that can be removed? Okay, Um are we hydrating well to help the liver process? Are we looking at how your body is methylating and actually 
processing it. Like if you imagine um, you go to a water park and there's all the water slides and everybody's on the little tubes, right? So if you're going down a water slide and a tube gets stuck and more are coming down, everybody's getting stuck. And so if the liver isn't functioning well, that's a getting stuck. If your body isn't detoxing in a healthy way through the methylation pathways, that's a tube getting stuck. If you're constipated and not pooping at least once a day, that's a tube getting stuck. And now everything else gets stuck behind it. And ironically, the body will then reabsorb it. Okay. So detoxification is really important. It's one of the reasons why I really encourage women to hydrate well, sweat often, add in ground flax and fiber, right? Um, thyroid, just to speak to that, I already spoke to the labs that would be great to order, but also what can we do to support our, our thyroid? We speak our truth. For some of us, adding in zinc-rich foods, selenium-rich foods. Um, for some of us, adding in iodine-rich foods. Adding in your ashwagandha as an adaptogen if your thyroid is sluggish. There's lots of options, okay? And I'm not your provider here, so I'm just giving you a bunch of examples to hopefully jot down. Take this think about it a little bit and then take it back to who your provider is. And if you go to your provider and you ask these questions and they don't know anything about it and they just want to give you another prescription or surgery or Band-Aid, you get to ask yourself the question, is that working for me? And if it is, good on you, mate. If it's not, then you get to start searching for someone different. Find someone who's going to look underneath the hood and first start with nutrition and lifestyle and how you're thinking and how you're being. For the hormones specifically, let's say your estrogen is high. Um, You want to increase your cruciferous veggies. So that's like your broccoli, your cauliflower, your kale, your Brussels sprouts. Those specifically help the body detox the excess estrogen. Okay. We want to make sure that you're adding in fiber rich foods, plant rich diet, all of your phytoestrogens. That's going to help balance the estrogen as well. Fascinatingly enough, phytoestrogens, meaning estrogen from plants, your um, primrose, red clover, quality soy that's organic and non GMO, um, flax, so ground flax. If your estrogen is low and you eat a diet rich in phytoestrogens, the estrogen will go up. If your estrogen is too high and you eat a diet high in phytoestrogens, the estrogen is going to go down. It's so fascinating, okay? Um, And then really supporting that methylation to help the body better detoxify the estrogen. So like I said, sweating, making sure you're pooping. For some women, a methylated B complex, a glutathione um, can sometimes be helpful there. And DIM, D-I-M is like cruciferous veggies all concentrated in a supplement. For the progesterone side, if we want to increase the progesterone, because maybe it's not actually that the estrogen is too high, but it's just that we need to bring the progesterone up to balance those two out. Well, we need to support ovulation, which means stress reduction and blood sugar management, and better diet, and more fruits and vegetables, all that stuff. But also some things that specifically help to increase the progesterone could be wild yam cream during the second half of your cycle, chase tree berry. I've even heard that just excess, more cinnamon and ginger can be helpful to progesterone, making sure that you're sleeping better, reducing stress, and living your life that honors the dynamic rhythms of women. You often hear me talking about this, that We have our rhythms. We have our chapters of life and a lifespan. We have seasons in a year. We also have seasons in a given month in a 24-hour period. And so the more that we honor, whether we're in winter, spring, summer, or fall, and what that signifies in how we socialize and and what we eat and and what we expect of ourselves and, and how we honor our turn on and our desires and our socialization, all of that is very relevant to really honoring the dynamic nature of hormone production. And so it's a little bit more abstract, but it's really relevant and true. So even as we adjust how we exercise based on where we are in our monthly rhythms, even in our daily rhythms, 
when we are social, when we're not, when we're creative, when we're not, when we exercise, when we don't, when we eat, all of that, it really can be you finding your way that really serves your innate being, helps you really listen into your intuition to know when is the time to be out in the world socializing, brainstorming with the masses versus brainstorming with those that are closest and near and dear to you versus just being quiet, putting on extra layers and sitting by the fireplace reading a book. Okay. It's relevant and it's important. I think I'm coming to an end. The last thing that I wanted to say is our mindset is relevant and is important. So how you think about something is just as important as the actions that you're taking. So whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And it is amazing to me to watch women really transform their health, their passion, their relationships, their realities by first changing inside then outside. It's so fascinating to watch women shift the way in which they choose to see a scenario or choose to see themselves. And then the external world responds and shifts as well. And so there's a reason why prayer works. And there's a reason why uh, some individuals can have the same exact experience, but the way that they take it in and filter it and experience it can drastically be different in regard to stress levels. And so having a daily practice of gratitude, really being aware of, of how we're thinking And are we in fear and doomsday and constricted thinking, or are we in the place of trust and surrender and expansive thinking? And I believe that our cells hear that and respond. And so sometimes just the simple act of changing how you think and giving yourself permission to really rest and fully be you, fully expressed the uterus responds. We remember that the uterus is the place of our fertility. It's also the home of our creativity. And so when we allow ourselves to fully be expressed in who we are and allow that creativity to come alive, it's really fun to watch how women can shift their bleeding simply by making those changes and really coming to a place of self-honoring and making myself a priority, you making yourself a priority, addressing the old trauma that whether or not you accept it or not is there, it is living in your cells, the emotions that you're not allowing out are being expressed in some way, shape, or form, and the body keeps the score. And so often, especially in that area of our body, when a woman's womb is kind of yelling out for help with painful bleeding, excessive bleeding, irregular bleeding, I go, okay, What trauma is there from the womb, from early childhood, from our teenage years, our 20s, It's at any point in our life that has not yet been really handled and managed and dealt with? And so as we go in and release that, it allows for the expansiveness of that fertility and creativity energy and that area of our body to be fully expressed and heal. Okay? So really, truly, and the same thing just to speak to the, the thyroid as, as I'm talking about this energy, once again, that's the place of speaking our truth. And so it really is relevant and important in the context of this conversation because I believe that our womb knows, our heart listens, and our voice speaks. And so the more that we quiet down, we honor our rhythms, we don't necessarily go to these quote-unquote doctors who want to give us the next pill, Band-Aid care is our solution but we allow ourselves to deepen in, quiet down, listen in to what is it that my womb is saying? What is it that my womb knows? And allow my heart to really open, allow myself to be felt, allow myself to feel, right? To allow my heart to listen into that and then allow my voice to speak it out loud, to advocate for myself and stand up for myself and find other ways because the main thing I want you to know is if you are struggling with some of these symptoms around your menstrual cycle and you're not wanting just a pill or a surgery, I promise you there are other options. I promise you that they're there. It's not a quick fix. 
And sometimes it takes shifting how we think and shifting to a different provider that's really going to look under the hood and see you as a beautiful, complex, dynamic, ever-changing being. That's me. For some of you, you're welcome to reach out and ask questions about the work that I do with me and the team and the testing that I do. Because yes, I'm going to order your Dutch Plus and your GI map depending on which program of mine you come into. And yes, you can have access to the multidisciplinary team based on which program you come into so that we can address the mindset and the trauma and the nutrition and the personalized supplementation so that the bleeding pattern changes, but more importantly, whatever the cause of that is dealt with. So now we don't have to deal with the cascade of other symptoms that inevitably will show up when we continue to just put band-aids on festering wounds without getting to the cause of the wound. Okay. With that, I think you're awesome. Thanks for listening in. Uh, Would love a follow on the podcast if you're listening in the podcast. For those of you listening in the Facebook space, please comment. Please ask your questions. Let me know what really jumped out at you. What is your experience? I love to support you. And until next time, ta-ta for now. Thanks for listening to the show today. I know you have lots of choices and live a very productive life as we all do. I appreciate that you've allowed me to dive deep in your journey of feeling turned on by your life, your lover, and yourself. I trust you learned something expanded your self-reflection, and you're grateful we shared this time together. Connect with me at www.thewomensvibrancycode.com or on all social media platforms and YouTube by searching for Mariah Brown, M-A-R-A-Y-A Brown. Lastly, if you've found value in what we chatted about in this episode, please consider leaving me a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice. It helps others discover the podcast and get a feeling for the wonderful community we've all created together. As for now, I'm Mariah Brown, and you've been listening to the Women's Vibrancy Code.